George John Knudsen, born May 19, 1922, grew up on a sandy farm near Easton, Wisconsin, just north of the Wisconsin Dells. Back then, commercial interests were few in the Dells and the area's meandering lazy river and sandstone cliffs provided a unique setting for exploring the natural world. Turtles, snakes, and birds first grabbed young George's attention, and his turtle collection in particular gained him considerable local notoriety. Insects, too, fascinated him, and the large collection he established during his high school years became so well known that it came to the attention of Aldo Leopold. Knudsen graduated from Black River Falls High School in Black River Falls in June 1940. Less than two years later, he joined the Army, Corps of Engin uh, the Army Air Corps to fight in World War II. He attained the rank of sergeant during his service from December 42 to October 1945. Then he returned home to Wisconsin and attained a BS in zoology and botany from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In June, he began a 34, June 1949, he began a 34-year career with the DNR. He started as a wildlife biologist working on pheasant and quail research and management, then turned his attention as a fur bear research scientist to ecological studies of beaver, bear, and otter. In the early 1960s, George secured a, a naturalist position and eventually became the department's chief naturalist until his retirement on May 20, 1983. He was a strong advocate of converting abandoned railroad beds into state trails. Soon after I was born, my parents moved to Wisconsin Dells and purchased a large rooming house in Coddick cottage annex called Oak Villa. This was about 1925. The Dells at that time was a great place for a youngster to study nature. I started a turtle collection when I was just a little bit of a guy, and I kept a large number of them at Oak Villa, where our tourist clientele enjoyed looking at them. People always wanted to see my turtles, so I started talking about nature at an early age. I began observing birds, too, had a number of pet crows, English sparrows, and even a little screech owl for a while. When I was about nine, I started collecting snakes and showing them to our rumors. The Dells had a good population of fox snakes, garter snakes, and milk snakes. I didn't know much about them, so I'd go to the public library and read. I had no books since, I had no books since then. Since, since then, was, this was during the Great Depression, and we couldn't afford them. So I used the library to learn about my pets and use that information when talking to people about them. I suppose you could say that's when I started my career as an interpretive naturalist. My father was not an outdoorsman at all. He liked to fish a little, but that was it. He didn't hunt. I don't think he ever hunted. He was just so darn busy making a living. My parents never encouraged me to get outside. I didn't need to be encouraged. For one thing, our rooming house was right on the edge of a ravine that went right down into the Wisconsin River. I could go from the back porch across our lawn through a little edge of the woods at the top of the ravine, down the slope, and walk about a block to the river. That's where I caught my crayfish, water beetles, water snakes, and turtles on occasion. My mother always used to tease me, George, don't go in the ravine. There are snakes down there. I spent a lot of time in that ravine. By the mid-1930s, father had sold most of his businesses in the Dells. From about 1935 to 1940, he was the project manager for the Resettlement Administration, a federal program headquartered in Black River Falls. He was the chief honcho. The program goal was to buy farms on the sterile sands of Jackson, Juneau, and, Mon and Monroe counties, put the farmers on better farms, and convert the sandy lands to forest and wildlife production. He and the feds were responsible responsible for buying up all that land that is now the Black River State Forest. 
the Central Wisconsin Conservation Area, and the Nasita National Wildlife Refuge. He did a lot of work to get the whole area set up, but he never got any credit, credit for it. Since Dad was trying to convert land to game land and had game men working for him, one of his, count, one of his counsels was none other than Aldo Leopold. I met Aldo a number of times in the office. He'd come up on occasion. I don't know how many times he came up, but Dad and the game men would confer with him. I got to know Aldo then. I can remember when we had him out for dinner. At one time in particular when I showed him my insect collection of 7,200 insects. He was flabbergasted. Young, young kid like this with insect collection and they were mounted perfectly. I was always very meticulous about things and he couldn't get over that. The next time he came up, he said, George, get out the insects. We sat down on the Davenport and the next thing you know, we're on the floor with boxes all around, and he was, he was pointing, asking, what's this? What's that? One thing about Aldo, if he didn't know, he would never say, oh, yes, marvelous collection, I see. He'd always ask you if he, if he didn't know the name of the critter. He never acted as if he were the know-it-all professor. He was just a great, great man. I conducted research on beaver, bear, and otter during the years 1950 to 1962. I studied the three species in all parts of the range because the DNR wanted to obtain as much information as possible for future management purposes. I put in very long hours, often starting at five or six in the morning and finishing at dark. Work on black bear occurred from 1958 to 1962. At that time, we didn't know much about our black bear population. I was asked if I wanted to switch over to studies on them for a year or two. I said, yes. As with, as with all research projects, when you don't know much about a species, you study every aspect you can. So I plunged ahead with a status survey, a rain survey, and a study on food habits. The bear study was basically in the northern two, two tiers of counties, all the way across the north. But we concentrated our trapping efforts in Bayfield, Douglas, and Washburn counties, in the Northwest, and in Forest, Vilas, and Oneida, Oneida counties in the Northeast. We ran 35 traps a day. It would take three to four hours to set them, lots of careful work. We'd set them and tended them daily for two to three weeks. We'd have to move them on occasion. We were, we were stuck more than we were moving half the time because of the muddy roads from the constant rain and all these back trails. You'd like to get a hold of those guys that built the Rose roads in the first place. They were pretty awful. We'd get up early and sometimes we wouldn't get in until 10 or 11 at night. We wanted to study movements because in those days there were people worried about shooting all the bears. I wanted to find out as much as I could about bear movements for the simple reason that we trapped, and the, and the DNR still does, quote unquote, complaint bear. I wanted to know how far we had to haul a bear and release it so we wouldn't raise another complaint. <laughs> I didn't want to trap a bear and shoot it. That had been happening a lot. I couldn't see wasting bears like that when we could determine how far we had to go to release them. I wanted to found, find out how far they moved to a, in a certain period of time. We found out that there was a tremendous amount of movement, especially among the males. With males, we got an average yearly move of 18 miles. That's half a county. They'd go across that county, find a few female residents, and have cubs to bolster the bear, the bear population. When you have a good, viable, population, that's the time to study them, not when they're going downhill. What were the techniques we used? We ear tagged them, live trapped them with steel traps, and I designed the traps so they would only catch the foot and not break any bones. They broke a few bones fighting the traps, but out of 181 bears, 
we only had 78% that showed broken bones, any broken bones at all. They're tough. We had only one bear lose his foot right up in Drummond, Bayfield County. He was up a tree and he hung himself and his foot was up in the air. When I got him out of that tree, which was quite a job at 250 pounds, I saw that his paw was all pink. I said to my helper, Alvin Yeager, nicknamed Dewey, God, he's going to lose that foot. I was ready to kill him, but I thought, no, let's, let's just see how tough this old boy is. So I ear tagged him and let him go. Two and a half months later, people in Drummond were concerned that there was a bear at the dump coming into town to tear into people's garbage cans. So George Phillips, the warden up there, shot it and saw the ear tag and the bear's missing right front foot. He called Jaeger and he went over and got the carcass. To make a long story short, that bear moved 14 miles in a two and a half month period, lost its right foot and gained 65 pounds. They're tough old boys, I tell you. A word or two about Jaeger. He lived in northwestern Wisconsin at the time. He was a fantastic live trapper of beaver, coyote, and bear. He handled all the bear complaints and, and did that for years. He was really ingenious. He could think things up so fast to get you out of situation. He always carried his share of the workload and much more. One of my favorite stories involves a bear at the dairy, fair, at the dairy farm resort up by Boulder Junction. There was a dump right behind the resort that bears used, so we thought we'd come up and try to live trap around the dump. There were open dumps in those days. The tourists staying at the resort knew we were coming up somehow. People came up to us telling us about the big tracks, the little tracks, about the weight of this one and the weight of that one. We told them that maybe we would come back in a few days and set one of our big culvert traps, so we did. We drove in, the tourists saw us coming, and the whole dang bunch got in their cars. Some walked from the resort down to the dump. We must have had 15 to 20 people down there. When we approached the dump, there was a bear there that was a pretty tame old gal. I turned to Dewey and said, gosh, there's only one tree. Maybe if I chase her, she'd go up that tree and we can, and we can get her without even trapping her. So I took off out of the truck. People started yelling and clapping. Me after that bear. The bear scooted out and up the dang tree, just as nice as could be. So here's the bear sitting up in the tree with no trap, nothing to keep the bear from coming down. But when there's a crowd like that, you know, you've got a chance to get a bear for free. I thought, heck, it's worth the chance. So I climbed up under this bear with my needle and got right up under her fanny and gave her a little shot. She blew at me and I thought, boy, if she starts coming down, she's going to use me as part of the tree. But she just stayed up there and pretty soon she just started quivering. Well, then she started slipping and down she came right beside me. She was a big one probably about 180 pounds. I put my arm around her and both the bear and I skidded down that tree. Those people watching had eyeballs that big, watching me, a big Norwegian, coming down the tree with that bear. Of course, I couldn't hold 180 pounds. It was mostly a scrambling fall for about 15 feet. The bear was out when we got down there. I was a big hero that day. So from that time on, every time I was up in that country club area, people, people would say, there's the guy that climbed the tree and got that live bear. Shoulder up your gun and whistle up your dog. Shoulder up your gun and whistle up your dog. Out to the woods for to catch a groundhog. Oh, groundhog. Ate our carrots, peppers, and peas. Ate our carrots, peppers,
peppers and peas chopped our beans off to their knees. Oh, brown hog. Here comes Sally with a ten-foot pole. Here comes Sally with a ten-foot pole. Or out that whistle pig out of his hole. Oh, brown hog. I dug down, but I didn't dig deep. I dug down, but I didn't dig deep. Found that whistle pig fast asleep. Oh, brown hog. Here comes Sally with a whistle and a grin. Here comes Sally with a whistle and a grin. Groundhog grease all over her chin. Oh, brown hog. Children screamed and the children cried. The children screamed and the children cried. But they loved their whistle pig stewed and fried. Oh, brown hog. Eat up the meat and tan the hide. Eat up the meat and tan the hide. Make the best blue strings that ever was tied. Oh, brown hog. Shoulder up your gun and whistle up your dog. Shoulder up your gun and whistle up your dog. Out to the woods for to catch a groundhog. Oh, 